These are the times that try men's souls. Given everything that is going on in the world today, this famous line from the beginning of Thomas Paine's The Crisis Number One seemed like an appropriate way to introduce my topic, which is dealing with disappointment. Now, I realize that many of you are already experts on this topic because you are Browns fans. <laughs> but I hope you will indulge me as I explain why I think this is a timely topic. As some of you may have heard, we had a national election this week, and every election cycle, one side or the other, tends to walk away disappointed. This year, it seems as though people on both sides are dissatisfied with the results. And I presume many more people are dispirited by the way things are unfolding as America begins to look more like a banana republic than the shining city on the hill known for its fair and free elections. I've personally experienced disappointment in different areas of my life the last couple of weeks, and I'm sure you have as well. So I thought this would be a good time for a biblical examination of how we are to deal with this common, yet potentially very dangerous emotion. In her Facing Your Feelings series, the late Vicki Kraft says that there are two main reasons we develop feelings of disappointment, people and circumstances. Here's what she has to say about each. Quote, when we set our hearts on people or on circumstances, we are usually disappointed. God wants us to set our hearts only on him. He wants us to trust in his goodness, even in the midst of our deepest disappointments, end quote. Brethren, trusting in people or circumstances is a risky proposition because both are changeable or variable. But trusting in our steadfast Lord's immutable word can bring us the peace and comfort we seek. Let's look at some examples from the Bible. Scripture is full of people who are, were dissatisfied and distraught about their circumstances. Take the case of Abraham. Imagine his feelings of disappointment and dread and being asked by God to sacrifice his son, Isaac. Abraham surely could not understand this request. And perhaps he had to fight feelings of betrayal because he had a good relationship with the Lord. Nevertheless, Abraham decided to trust in God's goodness and justice. And in the end, God blessed Abraham by promising him descendants as numerous as the stars in heaven and the sands of the shore. Descendants through which all nations of the world would be blessed. Elijah is another good example of someone who is disillusioned by his circumstances. After defeating Baal's priests by calling down God's fire from heaven and soon after having them killed, the wicked queen Jezebel sought revenge on Elijah, who then fled for his life. Discouraged, exhausted, and alone, Elijah finally stopped running and laid down and asked the Lord to take his life, for he had had enough of his struggles and believed that only he still worshipped the God of Israel. But the Lord renewed his strength and sent him back with assurances of protection and a companion in his re replacement, Elijah. And he went, excuse me, and he informed Elijah, Elijah that there were 7,000 others who had never bent their knees in worship of Baal. As we know, God would eventually transport Elijah away in a whirlwind. Christ's disciples were another group who were disappointed in their circumstances. They expected the Messiah to overthrow the Roman authorities and to institute a new golden age in Israel. So you can imagine how discouraged they were when Christ was arrested, tortured, and killed. For a few days, they felt defeated, lost, and confused. Once again, however, God offered them hope and a new sense of purpose as, after Christ's resurrection. And with God's Holy Spirit bestowed upon them, they would venture out and change the world. There are also plenty of examples of biblical figures who were disappointed in other people. King David was often troubled by how others treated him. We all know what a difficult time David had when King Saul, whom he had served loyally, tried to have him killed. Even as king, David had to deal with the disheartening rebellion and death of his own son, Absalom, whom he loved greatly, making the sting of Absalom's revolt all the greater. Of course, there may have been nobody David was more disappointed in than himself for Absalom's rebellion was the direct result of his own scheming. When Nathan had revealed how loathsome David's sin of killing Uriah and stealing Bathsheba was to God, David was very remorseful and ashamed of himself. That did not, however, keep God from punishing him by promising the death of his baby and ensuring David would experience conflict and strife in his own household. 
Moses was often disappointed with the stiff-necked Israelites whom he led. He broke the tablets when he came down from the mountain to find the people sinning with the golden calf. At one point, some of the people had tried to rebel against his authority, and they were swallowed up by the earth for their treason. Even after 40 years in the wilderness together, Moses' anger with the people led him to sin publicly at Kadesh when he called forth water from the rock without giving credit to God. This event led God to prohibit Moses from entering the promised land, which may have led Moses to new levels of disappointment with himself. And finally, in the book of Hosea, we can imagine how crestfallen Hosea was with his adulterous wife, Gomer, whom God had told Hosea to marry. After being married to Hosea for some time and having children, some of whom may not have been his own, Gomer ran away to another man. However, God told Hosea to go buy Gomer back and care for her, just as God had done for the faithless Israelites. Both God and Hosea showed compassion and mercy, despite being continually let down by the infidelities of others. And the story of Hosea and Gomer is symbolic of how God has redeemed us sinners through the sacrifice of his son, Jesus Christ. Why is disappointment such a potentially dangerous emotion? To answer that, I'd like to turn your attention to a chart from Vicki Kraft's article. However, we don't have PowerPoint on our computer, so I, don't, uh, I probably won't be able to show you the chart. Maybe I could just hold it up here, uh, the slide I have. You probably won't be able to see it well, but it'll give you at least some idea of what I'm talking about. Uh, this chart comes from the same, same article I was referring to. And you, as you can see, it's a disappointment pyramid. Uh, disappointment is at the top of the pyramid. Uh, followed by discouragement, disillusionment, depression, and finally defeat. I'll exit that real quickly. Many of you may have heard that marijuana is a gateway drug that often leads people to other more serious harmful drugs. In essence, brethren, disappointment that is left unchecked acts in the same way for it is a gateway emotion that can lead to other more serious levels of emotional turmoil. And those were the uh, different levels of emotion that I showed there in the pyramid. Bitter disappointment, if left unchecked, can lead to the feelings of discouragement. Discouragement, in turn, leads to disillusionment, which is often followed by depression. Finally, feeling depressed can ultimately lead us to sink down into defeat. And it becomes very difficult to pull ourselves back up from these lower levels once we get there. You'll notice, though, that we only get down to those more serious emotional states by first experiencing the more commonplace emotion of disappointment at the top of the pyramid. Perhaps it is even more useful to think of it as the tip of a spear that allows those other feelings to enter our psyches. So what can we use to combat disappointment? The Bible indicates thankfulness is the best remedy for disappointment. Paul discusses this in Philippians 4, verses 6 through 7. 6 and 7. Uh, Philippians 4, verses 6 and 7. When he writes, Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let our requests be made known, by, known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Paul also tells us in 1 Thessalonians 5, Verse 18, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. In Matthew chapter 6, verses 26 through 30, Matthew chapter 6, verses 26 through 30, that's not supposed to be. Jesus Christ says, Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his stand of life? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin, yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into up to the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O ye little faith? The theme of thanksgiving is central to Psalm 100, which reads in its entirety, A psalm for giving thanks, 
Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name. For the Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever and his faithfulness to all generations. It would seem that Habakkuk took the advice of the psalmist in Psalm 100, despite knowing that God was going to punish Judah. For Habakkuk, in chapter 3, verses 17 through 19, states the following. Though the fig tree should not blossom, nor fruit be on the vines, the produce of the olive fail, and the fields yield no food. The flock be cut off from the fold, and there be no herd in the stalls. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will take joy in the God of my salvation. God, the Lord, is my strength. He makes my feet like the deer's. He makes me tread on high places. Brethren, when we remember to be thankful at the point of disappointment, as Habakkuk does here, we can head off the other more serious negative emotions that can drag us down to depression and defeat. Someone who seemed to know this well was my second cousin, Nikki Harold Steele. Nikki was born six months before I was, and we went to the same school, although she was in the class ahead of me. Every Independence Day of my youth was spent at her house. She was one of those people who was just good at everything she did, and she was involved in everything. She was also very friendly and popular. Last week, Nikki died, leaving behind her husband, a son in high school, and three daughters in college. She started battling breast cancer 12 years ago when she was in her mid-30s. According to my mother, 10 days before she died, Nikki was told by her doctor that the cancer had spread to her liver and that she had at most a month to live. From what I could tell from the Facebook posts I read, she spent the time between that diagnosis and her death caring for those around her and reassuring them that things would be all right. She did not let the cancer get her down. She would not give in to disappointment and despair. In fact, the very last Facebook post from the end of her very last Facebook post from the end of September is a picture of her, her husband, and her son on the 50-yard line of the local high school football field. And she typed, the blessings continue. Glad this one is mine too. Brethren, let us follow the examples of Paul, Habakkuk, and Nikki. When we feel the pangs of bitter disappointment, don't give way to discouragement, disillusionment, and despair. Remember to be thankful for the blessings that we have, for they are abundant. God's love and mercy being foremost among them. As members of God's church, we of all people should be able to do that.